thanks a lot uh, professor sharma sir and uh, at the outset i would like to thank him for setting a great uh, immunological lab at sgpjms and uh, that uh, we are enjoying and we are carrying over uh, all the immunological work of, uh, uh, of renal transplantation. So we have a, uh, I am basically chosen this topic because uh, there are so many things in the literature that Professor Randava has just now told us about uh, the biomarkers for the T cell, molecular markers of the T cell mediated injections, B cell mediated injections, or so many HLA typings and all. So, but in a low resource setting, particularly for the transplant purpose and for the benefit of the patients. And when you have to balance between the money the your patients have, and you have to get the transplantation done. What we require, and what we require only for the research purposes. I always agree that research should go on, always go on. We should try as much as possible, but the research in low research setting can be totally different from the research in a high resource setting, where our government is spending less than 2.5% of the GDP on health structures, where USA is spending 12% of their GDP on health expenditures. So that becomes the limiting factors. So what we aim by immunological work, first work, Aim is to avoid hyperacute rejection. Second is to minimize the acute rejection. And then you can prolong as much as your graft survival. So, what was the historical impact of the immunological work upon what comes? When in 74, introduction of the CDC came into the picture, after that, hyperacute rejection becomes negligible almost. You don't see, even if you have the CDC there in your hand, rarely or seldom you will see any hyperacute rejection. When flow cytometry cross match came, acute rejection episodes further reduced. With the introduction of the DSA evaluation, donor specific antibody evaluation, chronic CRI, coronary renal allograft injury, the diagnosis becomes easy. And the impact on long-term outcome is still questionable. So what we are able to get out of this, something is going on. That is of the diagnostic values. We understand what is going on. But for the offering to the patients and getting the benefit out of this treatment is still questionable. So these tests also allow you to optimize the degree of immunosuppression and you are able to do some highly sensitized transplantation where it is thought that even you are doing transplantation of a very highly sensitized patients, their quality of life is far, far better than patient being on dialysis. So that is well established fact. So sometimes we take the risk of going for the transplantation even in a very high risk or highly sensitized patient. And there these tests help us know how much risk is there and how you can go about the transplantation or how you can design your protocol for immunosuppression. So the final aim to get into the test. The first test always comes as Professor Sarma has pointed out, HLA. HLA, and sometimes you can, you can think of without doing HLA whether we can go for the transplantation or not. So I will say, most of the disease donor transplantation, which we are doing, doing without HLA. We don't have the HLA report at that point of the time. But when you are doing the living donor transplantation and you are expecting something, and now the availability of the donor specific antibody, you need to have the details of your HLA high resolution mapping. This is very simple. You can have the CDC cross match, get the serum of the recipient, get the lymphocytes from the donor, mix this, add some complements, you will get the cell lysis. More than 20% cell lysis is cross match positive, and you can, if it is negative, you can go for transplantation. And that's, that is the usual reality in low resource setting in most of the centers, even where the disease donor transplant program is well established, only CDC is being done and the patients are going for the transplantation. We all understand class one and class two, 
HLA molecules, three chains here, three alpha chains, two alpha and two beta chains are there in class two. When any antigen is binding to the class one, direct presentation to CD8 cytotoxicity cells and more severe injury, more severe acute cellular injections. HLA class two, the cells, the antigens are processed through this antigen presenting cells and then it is presented. So there is a long period of the time and most of the time this are involved in dealing with some chronic injury to the dark. So we all also understand that HLA molecule is a highly polymorphic. Each MHC locus has 1,000 to 5,000 allelic variants. And this extensive polymorphism is what creates a major obstacle to successful transplantation. When your patient on long-term dialysis, lot of blood transfusion, multiple pregnancy, previous cross-match positivity, highly sensitized transplantation, there it rolls comes whether this antibody which you are detecting by the different tests is really a donor specific antibody. It is specific to the donor HLA. But what we see in the real life, what we do in load source settings, we are not getting all class one antigen HLA, B and C. For in class two, among the DP, DQ, DR, what we are doing? Only HLA, DRB1. So this is all classical in load source setting from the HLA, A and B, DRB1, that we are doing at present in load source settings for the practical purposes of the outcomes. Immediate outcomes are relatively good until unless there is some challenging scenario is there. So HLA typing methods, what is our limitations? There are serological methods, that is all. None of us we are doing now. DNA-based molecular techniques are different. Five types of techniques are there. At present in SGPJ, what we are doing, SSOP typing. It is good sometimes on Luminex platforms. This gives the results of the high resolution, up to four digits you can get, but there is some ambiguity. So you cannot believe 100% on that. But next generation sequencing, we are not at present doing. Only we are trying to get it done whenever we, have, we are going for very highly sensitized transplantation. But advantage of SSP typing is there. It can take only three hours. You can get it rapidly. If you in the donor, this is donor transplant program. If you want to have the HLA typing also, then this test is useful. Otherwise, on Luminex platform, SSOP, typing is fine. Next generation, if available, can be done. But definitely, that has very high resolution and less ambiguity is always there with NGS. That would be preferred method for anyone. So this is the no, usual now the nomenclatures of the HLA when you see the reporting should be like this in the four digits with the separators. This is the molecular way of reporting the HLA. What we see particularly in our, our settings, what we can see, even if you are getting this HLA report of the four digits on luminous platform, but you cannot say 100% this is the high resolution and this is a specific, lot of ambiguity comes. Sometimes there is no ambiguity, but sometimes you have. But the literature says low resolution typing is sufficient for the solid organ transplantation. So whether except the bone marrow transplantation, where we are going to do, is it sufficient for us? Even if low resolution typing is there, you can go for the transplantation. So this is a limitation. Actually, for high resolution NGS machines are not there. Cost is almost three, four times higher. So we are not able to perform. That is the limitation in low resource settings. A screening for anti-HLA antibody. Nearly 30% of the wetlisted patients are known to have antibodies directed against one or more HLA, particularly where they are disease donor transplant program. Risk of sensitization clinically, these are three standard pregnancy, multiple pregnancy, blood transfusion, or previous transplantation. So these are high risk groups. So clinical assessment should always be there. And SCS for the antibody screening, you have the cell based cytotoxicity or solid phase assay. Sometimes you have the antigen non specific, antigen specific assay. 
what uh, practically in all load sort setting, what is done? As I have already pointed out, what we do, we do CDC. CDC cross most of the centers depends on this. Only things we are using this anti-human problems, AG CDC, or you are using DTT to resolve the autoantibody, and that gives you the better elongations, better results. Close atomatic cross match that is available with us. We try to do in every patients. Flow PRA in living donor, we are not doing, but in for the deceased donor transplantation, those who are wet listed hairs, we are doing here. So flow PRA is there. Definitely 77% of the positive B cell cross matches are not due to anti-HLA antibody. That we should always keep in the mind. So that is another important thing. So here is the photo macrograph. What we can see here in this uh, photograph, CDC. Candidate sera, donor T or B cells, you can give this some complement and read the lysis, close atomatic cross match. What only difference is there, what you are do, doing, fluorochrome conjugated antibody you are adding, and then you are running on the flow cytometer, and you are seeing how much of the channel shift is there. Antibody detection by the luminex strep platform. This is again now. I have uh, seen uh, at the many of the centers in the UK or USA, they are making their own beads. And they are manufacturing there for the research purposes particularly. So that can be done. But this facility is not still available with us. So we are not able to do. But the cost can be minimized by doing this. Recipient serum is added to a cocktail of the polystyrene beads, which purified HLA antigens are attached. And then what we can do, we can add on the conjugated immunoglobulin IgG. And again, when this binding happens, that is read, read through the flow cytometers. Flow cytometric analysis is, is done. And the Luminex platform is also the final reading is based on the flow cytometric analysis there. You, you just read on uh, Luminex platform. So single antigen bead assay. What is this? This assay only gives you the virtual kind of uh, things, the antibody which you are detecting here. Is totally virtual. It is not donor specific. For donor specificity, what you have to see, you have to the high resolution HLA of your donor, and then you have to see the antibody which you are detecting in your patients is really matching with this. So that is specific to the donor HLA. So you require to have the high resolution HLA matching here. How it is important when you are particularly dealing with the and uh, going for the highly sensitized transplantation. Problem is there. MFI value of uh, when you are getting on the single antigen BDSA, anti donor specific antibody, whatever is there, what should be the cutoff value for this? So that is not standardized across the world, varies from laboratory to laboratory. But for only, there are many false positive results also. Many times you might have the false negative results also. So that we can get, we can see the antibody is there. We have a lot of patients, our residents are here, agree with me. Many times we have a lot of antibodies are there. But when we are getting the CDC cross mass, that is negative. Getting the flow cytometric cross mass, that is negative. Really, this is complement fixing or not. And so now gradually over the time, I was very much confident. We go for the transplantation, nothing happens. And we have the outcomes. We have the outcomes data now. So scenario of workup in our scenario can be a little different. We don't have the facility to see on Q binding assay to complement fix it. But with this CDC and flow cytomatic cross match negativity, and even if multiple antibodies there, we are going for the transplantation. We are not uh, telling the patient you are not a fit candidate. So again, uh, here we can see the flow cytometric cross match with the channel shift. We are taking cutoff value of the T cell cross match of the more than 50 and B cell cross match of the one more than 150. But even this is not a standard. That also varies from lab to lab. So only we see what is the negative value and then your test value. And positive value, we are only taking that whether our test has, has been done, performed well. 
So then if everything is fine, this is uh, the cutoff value that also needs to be standardized and that vary from lab to lab, center to center. And sometimes uh, we will say that this is a too sensitive test. Does not if your CDC is negative, it does not add on too much of the value of the flow sample, but I, I do not agree with that. CDC should be done and flow cytometric cross match if available in the, in the centers, if the patient can afford, we can go for. That gives you confidence that no, you can go for highly sensitized transplantation. At present in DC donor transplantation, when I, I am not doing any CDC, all flow cytometric cross match, whatever we have done, the and uh, the result is excellent. We have never encountered very severe acute rejection or hyper acute rejection, even whatever we do, limited number of uh, the disease donor transplantation that is going well. So, flow cytometric cross match is good enough for doing because uh, this it takes hardly three to four hours of the time in getting the final results of this uh, flow cytometric cross match. So, definitely the same things are this flow cytometric cross match whether really we should worry for a positive or negative value, outcome is not totally different. So it might, you can say it is irrelevant, but it is important in some of the scenario, particularly when you are doing highly sensitized transplantation or dosage donor transplantation. Then uh, when we have a lot of antibodies on this uh, single antigen bin assay, I also, we also believe our residents will come with this uh, scoring system no, escorting is looking like more than 17, so whether we should go for transplantation or not. Even in that scenario, what we have seen, if your CDC is negative, flow cytomatic cross mass is negative, whatever antibody is there, we are alerted. It is likely that the patient may develop rejections. If they develop rejections, we have to be ready with her doing the plasma precisity. But uh, we are going for the transplantation. So no too much of the emphasis on this escorting system. But definitely, you should keep in the mind if this score is more than 17, you must be aware that this patient is likely to develop severe rejection. So, cross match testing for the donor specific antibodies that we all understand. We are skipping this. Up. Now, situation comes of the EP2 or EPLED mismatches. So, now we have the software of the HLA MathMaker, we need a computer based. So, whether really we need to do this EPLET or epitope matching. Actually, what else you are going to do out of this if you have the only living donor transplantation, you have single donor and recipient, limited number of donors, you have nothing to choose out of the multiple numbers as in DC donor transplantation abroad. There, it might have the role but in low resource setting, where you are totally a living donor transplantation, where is the role of the EPLET and epitope matching? Ideally, yes, for theoretical purpose, getting the better account for the research purpose and out outcome purposes. If you want to know, you can have, but uh, definitely I don't see too much of this EPLET and uh, epitope matching is required for any low resource setting transplantation program. So you all must be knowing about this EPLET and epitope. so I'm skipping this here. So this is our uh, transplant immunology lab that uh, has been set up about uh, 10 years before. Professor Sarma has initiated this, and now I'm taking care of this lab. So we have in the lab of the Luminex platform, we have this flow cytometric cross match, we have all kind of microscope facilities for the C CDC. So everything is there, done within this lab. This is a small lab, one room lab, but uh, even for the DC donor transplantation, we are doing for even the private hospitals here. Almost all DC donor transplantation done, all flow cytomatic cross match has been done by me, by us only in SGPGI, for even follow medics we are doing. And uh, we are successfully running program. We have not encountered any problem of the hyper acute rejection or very severe rejections with this close automatic cross match. SAB assay is actually a costly affair. So complement fixing antibodies that also needs to be a study. I totally agree. Whether this antibody is there, then you should have this A C1Q binding assay 
it is there in the literature. Many of the centers are doing, but still we are not doing this one few binding assay. If we have the CDC and force automatic cross match assay, so then uh, we assume that this might be non complement fixing antibody and we go ahead with the transplantation. Definitely, we all understand if your SAV is positive, flow is positive, CDC is positive, this would be the highest risk of the transplantation. If you have the SAV positive, flow positive, and negative CDC, you can take the risk and go for the transplantation. Modern, modern burden you can see over the donor specific antibody. When only SAV positive, flow negative, and CDC negative, lowest burden of the Donor specific antibody, we should understand, and we can go for the transplantations. So, immunological assessment or guidance, what the guidelines is. When you look at the KDGO guidelines, this suggests for the panel reactive antibody should be done. But in current scenario, where the living donor transplantation program predominantly happens, where is the role of the PRD? We have the only donor available in the family. So, investing money on the panel reactive antibody, it does not seem to be good. You can have the single antigen bead assay. You can have the CDC flow cytomatic cross match that gives you the good result and better outcome so that this patient is going to succeed for transplantation. Or, but definitely, all our patients who are wet listed for disease donor transplantation, we are getting this uh, panel reactive antibody for them. How much sensitize this patient? Or how much likely to have? In one transplantation, we have on the waiting list five, six recipients we have got. Four had positive flow cytomatic cross match because all were the second or third transplantation. And we have to return that we have called this next uh, set of this transplantation. So there it becomes important. We should have this uh, report of the panel reactive antibody. If it is likely that how much this patient is likely to be sensitized and uh, what is the chance of getting a donor from that regions or that full of the recipients. So this is our uh, own study, what we have published and what experience we have got over the years. What we can see here between 2000 to 2022, 124 uh, ABO incompatible transplant has been excluded, 2300 ABO compatible transplantation. What we have seen, 37% has cortical graft necrosis. And what you can see here with the experiences from the 2000 onwards, almost all graft necrosis happens up to 2012. After that, we have only one graft necrosis that happens because of the fungal infections, not because of the rejections. So as soon as we have introduced into the, our program of the flow cytometric cross match, along with, and uh, as soon as we have introduced the DSA, this number went down. And uh, our uh, rejection rate is approximately 5 to 6 percent, 5 to 6 percent. Seldom we get very severe rejections. 20 percent of our transplantations are ABO incompatible transplantation. We are not that much worried initially when we have started ABO incompatible transplantation. Patient comes in the flow. We have no too much of the anxiety of getting the ABO incompatible transplantation. They come, get the transplantation, go out with a similar outcome almost. So a screening of yellow antibodies in Seoul, St. Mary's hospitals, what they do? They do the cross match, CDC and flow cytomatic cross match, negative, go for the transplantation. Panel deactive antibody, they are positive, single antigen beta assay, C1Q binding assay. You can just see if this is complement binding assay, complement fixing DSA is there, you have to worry for the severe rejections. What we are doing at present at SGP journals. We see the clinical profile of the patient, see the low risk or high risk, risk high risk patient, second transplant, multiple blood transfusion, multiple pregnancy. First of all, what we do, we screen the patient by the Lyget based class one and class two broadly. What is it? if this is negative, we don't do anything. We go for the CDC cross match and if possible, flow cytomatic cross match, digestive proceed with the transplantation. If Lyget West is showing any class 1 or class 2 antibodies there, and our cutoff value is more than 1000 or for the class 1 and class 2, then we say it is borderline positive, more than 2000, we say this is positive, and in both borderline and positive 
Leger based assay for the class one and class two. Then we go for single antigen bead assay. That facility is with us. We do assess and then, then we see whether the patient is flow or CDC negative. We go for the transplantation, taking that probably this patient might be the high risk for the rejections. We choose gives anti thymocyte globulins as a induction agent. Otherwise, we used to be in normal patients, basilicimab based induction. If if this is positive, then, then we have tried to desensitize many patients. Now many patients of highly sensitized patients, they can afford treatments. We do desensitization and we go for the transplantation, high risk transplantation at our center is 20% ABU incompatible or approximately 10 to 15% of the second or third transplantation. So with this, uh, match, as this program matured enough, number of the second or failed allograts are also increased. So ladies and gentlemen, really we are working in the developing world, underdeveloped, we are working in the low resource settings. So always comes in the mind what our patient can afford. And based on that, we get the HLA done, A, B, and D are only if it requires high resolution mapping when we have single antigen bead assay. That we do later on when you have the class one or class two ligate based assay positives, and then we go for the detailed HLA mapping. C, DP, and DQ are not routinely performed. It is thought that probably immunogenicity of these HLA molecules are relatively less than A, B, and D are. It not induce formation of the antibody with the equal strength. So it is fine for the low resource setting. Single antigen assay is not performed in all. non HLA antibody is not routinely performed. Epitope matching is important to mean by sensitization, not performed. And the requirement in our scenario is questionable. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your kind attention.